Here we go. I want to talk a little bit about nuclear thermal propulsion and specifically how to break the taboo of using nuclear power and my wife is going to watch this at some point and beat me over the head if I say nuclear <laughs> instead of nuclear because her dad actually works at the uh, Westinghouse Bettis Atomic Power Laboratory and was one of the key people involved in the light water breeder reactor program. So uh, she's very picky about that word in particular. So what we're talking about, nuclear thermal propulsion is not bombs. It's not plutonium. It's highly enriched uranium, which is essentially radioactively inert until you make it go critical. Okay? The, uh, the information I'm sharing here, I'm not a hardware guy. I am not a, uh, a physicist. I'm a software engineer, and I just happen to think that this is one of the coolest ideas in sliced bread. Because this allows us, if you read the book um, by the, uh, the author James Dewar, um, he's got two books. One's called To the End of the Solar System, and the other one's called The Nuclear Rocket. Uh, the first book, To the End of the Solar System, is about the Kiwi and Nerva programs from the late 1960s through very, very early 1970s. It was canceled about the same time the shuttle program was started, and basically what it ended up being a political tit for tat and, uh, you know, thank you very much, Richard Nixon. They had actually demonstrated these engines. Uh, they, they had them, they had, they had been rolling for about, I think, about eight years. Uh, they'd, they'd fired a bunch of different prototypes. The last ones that they fired were basically uh, entirely successful, uh, ran for over an hour. So they fired an engine for an hour, which is, you know, a phenomenally hard thing to do with a, even a, a liquid propulsion rocket. Uh, and these engines produced 75,000 pounds of thrust on liquid hydrogen alone. So all they're really doing is they're, they're using the highly enriched uranium as a heat source. They're putting liquid hydrogen in the front end and very, very hot hydrogen out the back end and using it as thrust. So the uranium is a heat source, and that's all it is. So th this, very, this is a Wikipedia page on uh, nuclear thermal rocket. So if you look at it, th this picture here, you've got liquid hydrogen in this blue bubble. You've got a reactor with a bunch of tubes here, and you've got, you got a nozzle there. That's the whole engine. It requires one turbo pump and one fuel tank. Okay? So you save some, on the, you save some on, the, on the tankage just because you've only got to have one tank, and you've only got to have one... Uh, one uh, turbo pump, and uh, these engines are unusually. You th you think of you know how much thrust an engine puts out, but these engines are actually rated in how many watts they produce. Okay, so the engine that they uh, put out uh, that was called Kiwi 4B produced 1.2 megawatts. I'm sorry, produced 1.2 gigawatts, 1,200 megawatts of power. I mean, you go, well, how does that relate to thrust? You hear, you hear the hundreds of kilowatts or 250 kilowatts being talked about with the Basimir engine. Okay? But what does that really translate into how much thrust does it actually produce? Because all they ever talk about is kilowatts. Well, when you talk about these kinds of engines, watts equals thrust. And there's pretty much a linear line that goes approximately 50 pounds of thrust to the megawatt. Okay? So a 250 kilowatt Vasimir engine is going to produce about 13 pounds of thrust. All right, that's, you know, I could, I could pick up a box up here that weighs 13 pounds and that's how much thrust is gonna be, you know, pushing against the rocket. Okay, so uh, a Vasimir engine, it, it can run a long time. It runs very, very efficiently, but until they can scale up an electric power source into the multi-hundred megawatt range, you're not going to be able to talk about having a lot of thrust to be able to do anything. Even if you had a megawatt, you would only have 50 pounds. All right? And if you have, you know, you're trying to move the space station around, it's going to take a really long time. Now the engine is really efficient. 
these things are measured, uh, engine efficiency is measured in something called specific impulse. And that's basically how much thrust do you get out of um, one, give me, the right, give me the right measurement here, Dave. How much thrust do you get out of an engine for one pound of propellant for one minute? Second. One second, sorry. That's why it's called seconds of impulse. Um, the best that you can do with a chemical engine has been pretty much attained by the space shuttle main engines, and that number is 450. Okay? These engines start at 875. So even the baseline engine that they built in 1968 is twice as efficient as a space shuttle main engine. And it has less tankage because you've only got to have one tank and you've only got to have one turbo pump. All right? And that's a first generation engine that was built 45 years ago. Okay? What we know about those kinds of power systems and the simulation course capability that we have today on the supercomputers, we have to think about the computers that they were, that they were using in 1965, right? Here we are in 2010, 2011, they're actually, NASA's actually talking about turning this research back on in 2011, okay? It's, it's, it's in the talking about it stages, it's not really in the budget, per se. So if you, if you start thinking about, you know, they're talking about doing this, and you say, well, what about radiation, all those kinds of things? If you read the information by James DeWar and, and watch the space vidcast from uh, about a month ago, uh, 326, I think, but it might be 325. Um, it was the, it's still on the front page, I think, of space vidcast. Uh, watch that and, and listen to what James has to say about, about these kinds of systems. So, the biggest thing is you talk about radiation and, and anytime you talk about uh, nuclear power, people just get like, you know, crazy about it because it's, oh, it's radiation and it's going to poison the atmosphere and all this kind of stuff. Um, Moreover, not my backyard thing. The, the not my backyard problem, as well as the not invented here syndrome, but the not my backyard kind of issue. Um, in James' second book, he talks about uh, how we can do these kinds of engines not only in high Earth orbit above 100,000 feet to start the engines at above 100,000 feet. So you'd use a chemical rocket and or a, um, uh, an airplane lift not unlike White Knight 2, only bigger. If you can imagine bigger than that, the thing's huge. Uh, <laughs> it's got to be pretty cool. I mean, you've, you've seen it, right? Yeah. It's, it's got to be a pretty wild-looking bird up yeah. live. you just like, that flies? It's wild when uh, it's gear flies. So. Yeah, that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> the gear collapsing was bad. Anyway, um, so they talk about, you know, fly the things up to 50,000 feet at 500 miles an hour and then drop it, use chemical to go up to 100,000 feet, drop off the chemical stage, and then light the, uh, the, the nuclear, essentially, uh, third stage where your airplane's basically your first stage. Um, and so you're lighting that engine above 100,000 feet. Now, the trick above 100,000 feet is you're, you're above, like, 98% of the atmosphere. And so all of the, all the radiation essentially reflects back up into space. So there's no radiation would reach, would, uh, the radiation would not even get absorbed by the atmosphere, it gets reflected back out into space. There's way more radiation in space. Above 100,000 feet, the radiation gets absorbed or reflected back out of the atmosphere. So there's, there won't be any radiation that will come back down to Earth if you light the engine above 100,000 feet. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the first stage where we can say, look, if you do this, you know, we're not going to have radiation issues. We're going to say, well, you know, the kinds of issues you have are, well, we're going to launch this, you know, radioactive material from the Earth. What happens if there's an accident? You know, so how do we, how do we engage the public and educate them and break the taboo of using this kind of power for these kinds of applications in space? Now, we fly um, plutonium uh, radiothermal generators, RTGs, Radio, that's not the right word. Radioisotope thermal generators. I got it right. Okay. Um, it was close. It was close the first time. And it, it, they, um, we fly those. Those actually uh, are flying plutonium, uh, not highly enriched uranium. So we already do those kinds of things for deep space mission. There's one that's launching on uh, Curiosity, the MSL, and there's one on Cassini, and there's been one on most of the, the deeper space probes once you get out in the Mars kind of. Uh, orbits, it's really tough to do um, highly efficient solar power beyond that. So, 
Um, anybody, I, I want to engage people. What, how, do we, how do we tell the public that these kinds of things can be done safely? How do we tell the people, you know, do you have uh, any kind of, any people have reactions to that kind of energy? Yeah. So I'm a huge proponent of nuclear thermal power. I think that's an absolutely vital technology that's going to enable us to um, inhabit the solar system. Right. I'm also a large opponent of trying to do this in the atmosphere. First of all, math is against you. Math is against you because regardless of the ISP of the engine, the thrust to weight uh, ratio of nuclear thermal propulsion is so pitiful that trying to get out of the atmosphere on a nuclear thermal motor is going to be very hard if not impossible at all. Right. So there's been some recent uh, articles and blog entries that for me at least, were a compelling argument against using nuclear thermal, thermal uh, propulsion anywhere in the atmosphere, regardless of radioactivity. It doesn't help. Um, I think uh, John Dawes blog had yeah. an article about that recently. Uh -huh. The map clearly shows that doing this, that selenium boom gaps, right? Yeah. Um, doing this in the atmosphere doesn't pay. Having said that. Uh, that's, and that you think that that's regardless of the uh, specific impulse? Regardless of specific, the specific impulse isn't high enough to overcome oh, right. the, weight for, penalty, for the, the weight penalty of the nuclear thermal engine itself or its shielding. Yeah, the shielding is a, is a big issue. Right. You've got to have a cocoon around that and a shield around that. And that typically doesn't even include the cost of building a turbo pump. The turbo pump in this case is a huge issue because it right. has to push a tremendous amount of very fluffy hydrogen Right. really huge rate. So, Although they built that turbo pump in the 60s. That's, turbo pump isn't so much a problem, but there is a, a system solved problem in that integrating a nuclear thermal engine into a rocket, you think you're very difficult, very difficult time getting a thrust weight greater than one in a rocket in the focus. Right. So the application of this might very well be in the area of the flight regime where thrust to weight is less critical. Right. Outside the atmosphere, starting with Leo. Starting with Leo, right. An Earth departure stage based on nuclear thermal propulsion, I think it's a great idea. I think it actually has to happen and soon. It enables things like a um, serious increase in payload to anywhere outside of Leo. Right. Moon, Neos, yeah. Mars, uh, Phobos and Deimos, what have you. Right. So I think that's what we need to be focusing on because it allows us to focus on a goal that's technically easier to achieve, number one. And number two, doesn't have one third of the political problems associated with flying anything nuclear in the atmosphere. Right. If we focus on things that are beyond the atmosphere, we can just walk away from trying to convince people to allow us to run nuclear reactors in the atmosphere. Right. Okay. That just makes, that, that reduces the problem by a huge margin. Sure. Okay, so that's my take on it. Right. There, there's, I actually, um, there, there's, a, there's a guy from, uh, used to work at the DOE and a couple of other places named Anthony Zuccaro. Uh-huh. He wrote a wonderful book about it. What was the name again? Anthony Zuccaro. An Anthony Zuppero? Yeah, Z-U-B-P-E-R-O. Z-U-B-P-E-R-O. Uh, Zulu Union. Papa, Papa. Z U P P A R O. Ava, Romeo, okay. Oscar. Okay. Um, so he is findable on Wiki. On yeah, Wiki. I was trying to spell it so that it was in the archive, in the audio exactly. archive. Um, great book about the trade offs in nuclear thermal propulsion. I, I think he makes a compelling case for not only the fact that we should do nuclear thermal propulsion, uh -huh. but how to go about doing it in a way that hugely reduces development and operational cost. His scheme um, shows the map for doing uh, tens of thousands of tons of payload right. for the same costs as the conventional nuclear thermal propulsion would do for tens of thousands of pounds. Wow. So I, I, I can't... Yeah, ja James DeWar makes some of those same points in, in the yeah. nuclear rocket where he talks right, about... Work, they work together at one point or another. In oh, sure. In book, he references DeWar yeah. sometimes. 
Yeah, Duar's bibliography in the back is incredibly exhaustive, and he worked with people and on some of this stuff in the 60s and 70s. Um, and he does make the same point about the current, uh, the current level of technology. Until you get above a specific impulse, I think he did a number of about 2,000 ISP, you really just can't launch from the Earth's surface. It's just not even possible. Yep. And even then, I think, once you get above that number, he would still want to do an air launch uh, because that gives you a controlled um, uh, launch site that's like, you know, over the deep Pacific somewhere. Yeah. Um, you still have the so. problem of what happens when you have a no light. Um, oh, sure. And he addresses that in the book. At 100,000 feet, you have a no light aboard on a very heavy, very dense vehicle. Right. With a, very, you know, with a ballistic coefficient that will guarantee that you'll actually get to the surface in time. Actually, yes. Show 325 right? Show 325 on and Space Vidcast. In his own words, in an interview, he talks about his entire plan. But as yeah, our chapter pointed out, it wasn't highly technical, because that's not really, really right. what it is. So they've been working with him to come back with a highly technical variation. Oh, great. And it's quantum gene, so anyone who wants more information on that or wants to contribute, uh, just email us uh, Trent Waddington at gmail.com. Trent Waddington at gmail.com. And his name is Quantum G on Twitter. And Space Vidcast chat uh, has been talking about it. Uh, I'll get to you in a second. Um, and uh, James's first book, uh, called To the End of the Solar System, is actually the technical book about the Kiwi and Nerva programs. His second book, called The Nuclear Rocket, is largely social and political about the kinds of things that would become enabled you know, if, we, uh, if we had these kinds of technologies. And for instance, if they had kept the research going at the time, he, he actually proposes to create a government chartered corporation to, uh, to do this that would be basically a combination of, of DOD and Atomic Energy Commission and NASA that he wants to call Nuke Rock Corp. Um, I think it needs to be the Nuclear Energy Rocket Development Corporation, which is N-E-R-D Corp. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <That's> awesome. <laughs> My name is Emery Stagmer. I'm Vax Headroom on the chat and on Twitter. Uh, both. Um, <laughs> and and the, 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 the thing I want to get to, I wanted to provide a little bit of a technical background for the people who didn't know what this technology is and how it functioned. I want to provide a little bit of technical background. What I really, really want to talk about is how do, I, how do I tell a story that says, you know, uh, to somebody who says, oh, that's radiation is going to hurt everybody and blow up and poison the atmosphere. How do you, how do you engage that conversation and, and what kinds of things, uh, you know, I just... I have people who ask me that question all the time. Well, what about radiation in the atmosphere? I'm like, I'm not a physicist. I really don't know this stuff. I'm, a, you know, I'm an advocate of what I've read and the kinds of things that I've seen people talk about. So I just wanted to kind of get you know, kind of an engagement kind of questions more than anything here. Ben, can you hear that audio? Uh, Probably. I've got a small delay, but you may have heard. Okay, so the, the point was, um, I'm going to really paraphrase you about that long. <laughs> what, what happens to, uh, people are afraid of getting sick from radiation, and so how do we kind of uh, address the question in terms of the disposal of these things um, after they've been used or after they've become radioactive, and how do we deal with that and think about it in terms of um, addressing those kinds of questions? Have I got most of that? Okay. But also to jump off of something you just said, we need to provide examples of where we're using this technology safely and people may not realize that we need that. Oh, yeah. Um, where are we using this technology safely already? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like there's a reason they brought nuclear off of um, NMR, so nuclear dynamics resonance imaging. Like, 
Right. right. That, you know, people don't like that word, but being able to say, look, you know, when you get sick and go to the hospital, like doctors use this on you. you know, being able to say that we use this kind of technology. We use this technology safely all the time, and, and MRI is actually a nuclear generated, yeah. you know, kinds of things. So, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, maybe what you can do to really uh, build foundational capacity for your cause is, is to, to build a movement that actually keeps keeps that that uh, policy in place and trans the Obama administration. Yeah, it's got to be. It's got to be. It's going to take a while. Uh, so it's got to be. You know, the Obama administration is at at least two more years, but. No more than whatever that number. No more than ten, sure. and it, it, it'll take it'll take ten years to do this. Well, whatever, whether it's uh, nuclear electric or uh, right. you know, thermal, or we definitely need nuclear electric for all kinds of other things. Sure, so yeah, we need fission power plants in the moon. We need fission power plants uh, to be able to do. If you're going to go to Mars, uh, you know, if you need a, a megawatt of power in order to do any kind of real production or anything, you know, so it's going to be a fission plant. Right. The talk about domestic plutonium production is already being put back into place and making sure that we, we point out to people that, hey, it's already being done. We're already doing it safely. How do we... Well, that, that can be turned off by executive order. Yeah. Easily. So, so it, um, you know, and by doing that, you also provide a capacity for us to, uh, to keep our RTG production in place for the flagship mission. Yeah. Can we take another hand? Yeah. Okay. So. Can we get around the perception problem? I mean, is it even possible? Yeah, how do we get around the perception problem, well, Dave? Part, part of the perception problem is just, hey, let's do this, let's do this off of orbit. There's no chance in heck of something falling back to Earth. Right. If, if, if you lower the orbit, maybe you'll have to do it up to L5, L4 or something. If you do it outside the orbit, there is no problem. Well, you still got to loft the material, and that's got a perception problem all its own. You still got to loft the highly enriched uranium up there in the first place. You can do that in small pieces. Right. You can do it in subcritical pieces. Right. Uh, James points out that there's already been, like, you know, the the uh, reentry vehicles for, uh, you know, atomic warheads, um, already survive things like rocket sled impacts. Yeah. You know, I think he said they, they put a dent in the thing when they hit it with a 600 mile an hour rocket sled, We're you know. A reactor, the, the, a reactor, the fairly big piece of engineering. That's not. Uh, That's the size of a 55 gallon drum. Uh, Kiwi 4B was a, Kiwi 4B was 33 inches and 55 inches tall. Yeah. That's just the reactor. It's just the reactor. It's that's not, it's not that's the, the hot part. It's not the turbo machinery, which gets hot too, because it's oh, it does. behind the machine. Well, it does, it does once machine. you light it. Before you light it, there, yeah. there's even pictures in his book of people walk, working around these things within 15 feet of them because they're not reactive. But when, once you get beyond the atmosphere, once you get beyond Leo, yeah. a lot of these issues go away. They sure. Just, you don't have to deal with them. You don't have to spend your time dealing with this, you can spend your time on advocating the positive aspects of it. You know, there's a reason why you, you, you will never hear an ad from an airline how their planes don't crash. Right. It's a marketing, it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty clear marketing strategy that says don't ever affiliate the word crash and the word airplane. Even don't crash. Even the, even you don't even say you never say that an airplane doesn't even don't crash. It's right. that it, you just don't you just disassociate it entirely. So if you just disassociate NTR from anything having to do with the atmosphere, other than we fly through the atmosphere with small chunks of the fuel initially, right? You know that reduces the problem by a huge margin because then you can say, well, that's just like the RTGs that we've been flying for twenty years. Flying a, a working reactor anywhere near the atmosphere is completely not like an MRI machine. Right. If MRI machines do not spew, you know, hundreds of thousands of tons of hydrogen that just went through the reactor right. out the back end. Right. Right. They, they don't do that. 
It's not the same. Yeah. And, and saying that you know, apply NTRs to the atmosphere, great, but they're not reactors. Yeah, they're not reactors at that point. So yeah. if we just walk away from that altogether, we can get 99.9% of the value of the NTR for the purpose of colonization of the solar system without having to deal with, you know, 75% of the perceptual problem. Yeah, but what happens when mass media, you know, the big teams that no longer have science built into it, <laughs> grabs onto this and realizes that we're sending radioactive material off? Because it has to pass through our atmosphere regardless. And again, they don't have a science team that's not going to be saying in spewing information out, how are we going to control It's that? our job. And our job is to say, it's just like the NTR. We've been doing it for 20 years. We know how it's going to work. It's just like the NTR. Yeah. The kind of sending more than a few pounds at any time. It's it's a block that's encased in bazillion layers of unobtainium. But you know, know, will that put people's minds at ease, or are they or are them they going to think, oh my God, we've been doing this for twenty years. Why do I remind you that what Ben's talking about is which Ben? This Ben. This Ben is all of these crazy people up and down the sidewalks here <laughs> that we had to fight to get here. Um, I'm not so much worried about the. Like back and don't care about reality. It's about, it's about Actually, the, the left wingers are the bigger problem than the right wingers, but well, that's a whole different the, problem. It, 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 it's a fringe, yeah. But I mean, they're, both, they're both on both ends of the spectrum. You know, you have people yeah. who do not care about the facts. There's two percenters on both ends of the spectrum. But let's 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 focus on. It's definitely a bell-shaped curve. Let's focus on addressing their issue on a much narrower problem of we're only dragging through the atmosphere 10 pounds of the fuel at a time. Well, my point is, though, I think they're going to blow it back up into a much bigger issue because you're using the big, scary word. Well, that's yeah. So yeah. If you're using the N-word, the media is going to jump on it with both feet. And unfortunately, logic and science, I don't think, is going to make any impact here. we got to get around the big, scary word somehow, somehow. Yeah, how do we break the taboo of using the N-word, not the this, this, the nuclear N word, not the other N word. So you do you rebrand it? You rebrand it? Right. They drop the N out of MRI to get rid of that. Right. Good point. I mean, we know that the crazies are going to come out of the woodwork from the media on things like this. Why? Personal experience. I worked on the L Cross program, and the media came out of the freaking woodwork. The nutcases, the psychics, and everybody. You know, they're bombing the moon. It was headlines all over the you world. Know, you know, you did not get any help from the NASA Ames director. You first used the terms. Yeah. <laughs> well, General Pete Warden is a great guy. Um, that's he all is. I can say. He's a great guy, but sometimes he doesn't help. Yeah, it's, uh, sometimes he doesn't help. But anyhow, um, so, but yeah, if, if, the, if, the, if the media is going to ever possibly mischaracterize something, this is something that they're going to mischaracterize. And that's like, why nothing has yeah. been done on it since Nixon's day. Right, that's why nothing's been done on it in you know, 50 years. I'm sorry, I can't hear. Sorry. Right, and, and it really is, but it really is a public perception problem, I think. Um, the, the cost of doing this is just not, you know, they're not in the hundreds of billions of dollars. I mean, it's not catastrophically high. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's, it's really a perception problem. It's not even a cost need, problem. What we really need is we need help from folks that are very, very good at communicating with the average Joe. We need folks like both Ben we need folks like, let's start with people already in the community, like Rick Tomlinson. We need folks like um, Alan, the, the guy from MSNBC, Alan Boyle. Alan Boyle. We Alan need Boyle. folks like Tom Hanks. We need Tom folks Hanks, like yeah. James Cameron. You know, Cameron would be a great, Cam, James Cameron would be a great guy to try and get. Cameron on board you settle the problem. Yeah. There you go. We gotta, gotta get a, uh, we gotta get a foot in the door in James Cameron's office. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I mean, because Hanks, Hanks and Cameron have a lot of credibility in the, in the, the part of the political spectrum where we're most likely to see problems. We just need to get James Cameron to start watching Space Vidcast. That's what we need. Well, no, I don't think we want to do that. Just watch that. What? 
Uh, what the hell? No, actually, I think he'd like it. Uh, I've seen a couple of his uh, documentaries where he's made the, the, the IMAX documentaries of going down under the water and stuff. That's incredible. I think, I, think he'd, I think he'd like what you guys are doing. But anyway. <laughs> Why is the 3D in? You say, I can, I can prototype the cameras for you for, for you know, 3D webcasting. Just, you know, send me some of the equipment. <clears throat> we'll, we'll run that for you. So, but, I, but, but that's the way to do this, is, is to find, to narrow the problem front down to what is absolutely necessary, and then get the right people who have the right skills at communicating and persuasive. I mean, ideally what you want is you want both, you know, Obama and Glenn Beck on the same bandwagon. And I know very little will happen in dogs and cats living together. But you know, <laughs> ideally what you want is, is people whose job it is every day and whose skill set is communicating and convincing and get them on the bandwagon uh, to, to help promote the idea. Short of that, like, I'm not even convincing half of you guys talking. You know, who the hell right, right. Do you have something? Right. So really our hurdles are convincing leadership at NASA mm -hmm. and the public. So it's leadership and the public and well, finding a good there, advocate. There is a third problem. There, there is the international diplomacy. There is a significant <laughs> function of that because, I mean, most of why we stopped doing nuclear testing is because there are nuclear testing treaties out there that really put in. Um, For explosives. I don't, I don't, that, I don't think so. Well, the test yeah. Treaty, the test ban treaty is actually why it is, is the reason given, whether it's, it's actually a true legal problem or not, it's in debate. It, but it's the reason given for stopping all the nuclear rocket. It doesn't help that the Russians dropped a nuclear reactor on Canada a few years back. Well, yeah. Um, and it ended up in pieces all over the Northern Territories. However, those, the self-same Russians are recently stepping up and offering their facility to start working on this uh, on NCR. Well, not actually NCR so much as the uh, as as just um, uh, react nuclear reactors as a as a source of space-based electric reactors. Electrical, yeah. electrical power generation. Yeah, electrical power uh, generation for know, space. And if you can get them and NASA to get a DOE that have a huge amount of expertise in building very, very power efficient, very safe mm -hmm. reactors. I mean, I, what I didn't hear on the list of organizations that you mentioned earlier was DOE, which I think is a, is, is a... Is isn't, a atomic, isn't the Atomic Energy Commission a DOE arm? Um, yeah, I thought they were. It, so. It's the engineering side of DOE that you want to Oh, is, right. You need, you need the engineering side and the legislative side. You gotta have yeah. both inside of DOE, yeah, that's true. DOE has tremendous, I mean, they had power packs. Like what you absolutely do not want is DOD. Right. Yeah. And then you're going to kill your public perception having it associated with DOD. Yeah, that's a good point. That is a good point. Having, it, having, it, well, having this associated with the Department of Defense is going to bring up the bomb, you know, in people's minds. Sure, they do. DOD may not care, but, I mean, if you ever want to kill a program very rapidly, fund that program through a DOD arm that is not popular, i.e., Right. I mean, DCX got cut because they were funded by political hot potato as part of the Department of Defense. Yeah, it's DOD. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. Now, having DOD as a, as a customer down the road is a different issue. Right. Yes. Yeah. But, you know, and having them on the team to help define requirements, you might consider that. But sure. DOE, you need the DOE folks. Oh, yeah, absolutely. They're the guys who really build the reactor. There's the guys who have the fuel, you know, and the control of the fuel more than anything. And they've been doing this for 50 years. Right. Yeah, they have. Um, the other interesting thing that was in uh, James' book is that they had multiple laboratories that were actually working on essentially competing designs. And so it was, it was almost a competition as to who could, who could figure out how to do this in the most efficient and, you know, uh, the most efficient way and also the way that, you know, would... Uh, Disintegrate the least. Yeah. Actually, that's a, probably a good way to put it, because as the as the liquid hydrogen 
flows through these things, it changes temperature by 3,000 degrees centigrade as from the top to the bottom, and it's only the size of a 55-gallon drum. So in, in that much space, it goes from what's, what's liquid hydrogen, 80 degrees Kelvin, something crazy, and... Yeah, seven two. So it goes from seventeen Kelvin to seventeen Kelvin to three thousand Kelvin. <laughs> so that's actually one of the arguments uh, uh, against using liquid hydrogen for this. Uh, so Para makes a very interesting argument for using plain old water. Using what? Water. Water, right? He advocates a steam rocket as opposed to a liquid hydrogen rocket, and he shows that yes, you lose a lot high speed wise, but what you lose in ISP more than make up for in thrust to weight and not having to deal with cryogenic hydrogen and all that other stuff. Cost of development, cost of operation. Yeah. And that's where he gets a lot of his advantages. Oh, that's interesting. That's, using that's, using that's, a, that's actually the great thing about nuclear thermals. You can pretty much use any word. Ammonia. Yeah. Well, uh, James makes a specific point that uh, rocket engines are all about two things: heat and weight. And the weight he's talking about is the weight of the propellant, what comes out the back end. And the lighter that you can make it, the faster that you can accelerate it. And energy equals mass times velocity squared. So the faster it comes out the back, you're, you have a squared portion of that equation so that um, the velocity goes up. So the, the, the amount of mass that comes out the back doesn't matter as much as uh, the velocity at which it comes out the back. And that generates, that's, that's heat. The so velocity you get through acceleration and if you're, if you're heating chamber is short, you have to accelerate it, very, you have to accelerate right. the problem very quickly. Right. But uh, I think, I think as with a lot of engineering problems, you'll find that going for the extreme of something it is not as effective as finding something that's more right. balanced with other considerations. Yeah, ex exactly. So, uh, you know, again, I'm a big proponent of, of steam and water-based and ammonia-based. Because it's just so uh, easy. To deal with, so much it's just water. Yeah, yeah. Pumping is so much easier because you know pumps. Yeah, but that's all. I mean, that's all technical details. We'll, we'll right. let the let the engineers figure that out. Yeah, people can people can figure out how to pump water. They can pump liquid hydrogen. They can pump water. It's just not that so hard. Much, so much easier. <laughs> it's so much easier. I agree. So yeah, and and heck, water's two thirds hydrogen anyway. And you can find it lots of places. Yeah, it's easy to. <laughs> yeah, we can, can get find water. Find a lot of it on the moon. Yeah, being able to refuel uh, one of these engines once you got to Mars, if you could just loft water, yeah, it makes it a lot easier. <laughs> How are we doing on time? Are we here, there, over? It's 10 till. It's 10 till. We're done. We're done. One more question. Uh, or comment. How you got interested in this? How I got interested in this? I got James's books for a Christmas present this year. Uh, my, I, I, uh, I told the wife I wanted uh, pretty much anything from Apogee Books because I didn't own hardly anything, and I got a reading stack like this. <laughs> so, uh, uh, including Dennis Wingo's book Moonrush, um, and uh, those were the three main ones that I got, and I've read all three of those now at least twice. Uh, just some really fascinating stuff, um, and I and I actually pushed Ben to get those guys on the, on the space bed kitchen. Yeah. Right. And and the I mean there's a there's a photograph of um, what they call the TNT test, where they actually intentionally detonated one of these Kiwi rocket engines, these nuclear thermal engines. They blew one up on purpose. There's a picture of the explosion. Okay, it went off with the force of what did he say? A hundred pounds of gr of black powder. It's a small number. I mean, you think about, you know, an atomic explosion. This is basically a, uh, it was almost basically a steam explosion almost, 
I mean, they, they blew it up, but it, it went out 600 yards. It blew out with a, the force of 100 pounds of black powder, not, not you know, a nuclear weapon. <laughs> This was when they intentionally blew it up to prove how safe it was. Yeah. And that should not be surprising considering how much difficulty that had the project had in actually getting a yeah. explosion. Yeah. Right. Yeah, the Manhattan Project had a big problem getting getting an explosion to actually occur. Um, because you, to do that, you have essentially have to compress the stuff and make sure that the explosion is contained so that it's a runaway, you know, neutron environment and that's not what this is. This exploded outwards and so the neutrons just fell to zero and the, and the radiation only went out hundreds of yards. I mean, it wasn't like a mile, it was hundreds of yards. Yeah, one last thing, thank you for bringing this topic back up yesterday. Oh, good, okay. Was this, was this up yesterday? This was not my topic yesterday. Uh, he's he's got got huh? He's got yeah. But I didn't put it up right. yesterday. I did put it up today. It may have come up, did you put it up from the, just from the list of no, I don't know. So I don't know who put it up yesterday. Well, thank you for bringing it up. Well, good. I wanted to make sure, because I did notice that it got dropped yesterday, and I wanted to make sure that we, we could talk about it. But the ideas of engaging engaging a James Cameron is just a brilliant idea. Um, and, and I, I know we're out of time, but really quickly, is this the direction we should go? I mean, there are a bunch of different propulsion tanks out there. Why this? The, and James Dewar makes this point. This is, the, the engines that have in the 800 to 1,000 specific impulse, exist already and they're essentially eight years worth of research, right? Lightly funded research. And we can start from that point today. We can build the Kiwi 4B again in a year, right? And that's only the first step and there's no limit in sight. The, you know, the, the ingenuity of an engineer or an engineering team in order to get more heat out of a radioactive environment is almost limitless. The ideas are already out there, some feasible, some maybe not, to get specific impulse in the numbers of a million. All right, if you have specific impulse in the numbers of a million, that changes the game completely. If you get to the point, yeah. If you get to the point where you even have numbers in the high thousands, uh, and they think that the 3,000 to 5,000 number is eminently reachable. That really changes the game. So. The, the, other, the other answer is that that's the cheapest way to move 10,000 tons. Okay. It's the cheapest way to move 10,000 tons around the solar system. Yeah. By far. Because you're never going to get... Uh, you're never going to get a specific impulse higher than about 450 out of a chemical engine. You just never, it can't be done. The most efficient combustion that we know of that's got the lowest molecular weight and the highest energy is a hydrogen or ox hydrogen oxygen, you know, liquid engine, and that's what the space shuttle main engines are, and we've basically reached the limit of what can be done with that technology. You might get a little bit higher. There's people out there that say that they think that they can get it to 500. But they're not going to get to 800, and this technology starts there. There, there, so. there is 600, but the environmental considerations make the nuclear like, yeah, you do a ride. Let's start with fluorine and go from there. Yeah, it gets, um, yeah. yeah it's the, a, it's a, um, a fluorine ozone. Fluorine <laughs> ozone? Oh my gosh. Hydrofluoric acid? <laughs> it's frightening, <laughs> frightening stuff. Atomic fluorine is much worse than I know, atomic fluorine, yeah, it just like reacts with absolutely everything. That, that fortunately is one of the major technical problems. It, it reacts with absolutely everything, so you can't. Yeah, you can't, you can't stop it from reacting with things, yeah. Anyhow. All right, thanks, everybody.